Well, let's go ahead and get started. Give me a three, two, one, and we'll welcome everybody, and we'll start. Well, hey, everybody out there in uh, Cyberland. I hope we're working again tonight. This is our third attempt. Hopefully, this one will go without a glitch. If you see anything that needs improving, please let us know. We're trying to get this down so that there are no glitches. Um, we're going to be in the third session of 10 in this study written by Francis Schaeffer back in the 1970s. How should we then live? And tonight we're going to look at the Renaissance. We've looked at ancient Rome. We looked at the Middle Ages. Tonight's the, the Renaissance. So with that being said, let's just take a minute and pray and ask the Lord to be with us. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us pray. Father, we always invite you to come by the Holy Spirit, that you would open your word to us and us to your word, that the teachings that we hear tonight would help us understand more fully our faith, the work that you have us to do in this life and put away all the distraction, all the busyness, all the voices that clamor for our attention. That we can sit at your feet tonight and learn of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm going to go ahead and um, get the video going and cut a couple of the lights so the screen will be more, more visible. And with that being said, let's get it rolling. one of the great periods of the history of man and as far as its artworks are concerned it's one of mankind's glories anyone who could walk through the museums and not be overwhelmed with the beauty of the work of its art in many many different mediums really is a very poor man indeed and yet at the same time we have to keep in mind that in the flow of the thought of man it opens the door for humanist man in a new way and carries this further and throws the doors wide open uh, that for all those problems that bring us right up into the period of modern man. The artists have done two things. They have reflected their culture, sometimes much more accurately than the writers, even the philosophers. And secondly, often they provide the way for the next step of, that's coming in culture. So sometimes they're a prophet, but always they're exhibiting that which is the culture of that day. The change that came with the Renaissance can clearly be observed in art. Up to that time, Florentine painting had been like Byzantine art, but even less polished, flat and without depth. And people were not portrayed realistically as real people. Then came Giotto, and with him, radical change. He was commissioned to paint The Last Judgment. And in it, he did a realistic portrait of his patron, Enrico Scrovini, a man who paid for the work. Nature was given its proper place. Proper, because nature is important as God made the world, and proper in the sense that nature is portrayed as it really is. On the other hand, his people are much too large for the scale of the world around them. Look at this bridge. How could this man fit into this observation platform or aim a bow and arrow out of this window? The same man who painted this designed the beautiful bell tower, the Campanile, next to the cathedral in Florence, a painter who creates buildings.
we now come to a great breakthrough in Renaissance art. Masaccio, a friend of Brunelleschi, used real live faces in his work, which gave a lifelike quality to it, which was unique in his day. Painters who preceded Masaccio, including his own teacher, Masolino, painted their figures seemingly on tiptoe. Masaccio had the feet of his people planted firmly on the ground. Masaccio was first to consistently use central perspective. This was a clear step ahead of the Romans, who only knew a different kind of perspective. By painting in the round, and by the use of the new perspective, his people were in the midst of realized space. There was actually space around the people. But for the men of the Renaissance, it was something more. It placed man in the center of that space, a space subordinated to the mathematical principles that came out from the mind of man. In Northern Europe, Jean van Eyck wrestled with the same problems in art. We're in St. Bavo Cathedral in Ghent, in Belgium. The rich, the poor, all classes and kinds of people from all kinds of backgrounds are coming to Christ. The artist appreciated and understood the biblical emphasis on Christ. He painted Christ as the Lamb of God, upright and alive upon the altar, symbolizing that he died as a substitute, a sacrifice, but that he is not now dead. According to Jesus' own words, I am the living one who became dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Van Eyck mastered light and air and was the first great master of landscape painting. Here is a true portrait of nature. Nature has its proper place in the world which God has made. The writers wrote the way the painters painted. Dante, in whose house I am at Florence, was an early and ideal example of this. His work was genius at its highest level. And the good master studying that train said, look there at that great soul that approaches and seems to shed no tears for all his pain. What kingliness moves with him even in hell? It is Jason, who by courage and good advice made off with a Colchian ram. He made more room for nature, but following the influence of Thomas Aquinas, he mixed the Christian and the classical world. In his divine comedy, the greatest sinners were Judas who betrayed Jesus and Brutus and Cassius who betrayed Caesar. In his own life, the problem of individual things versus meaning and values was clearly demonstrated. He loved Beatrice, whom he actually only saw a couple of times in his life, and held up their love as the romantic ideal. Seeing her face that is so fair to see, Love shed such perfect sweetness over me. But he married quite a different woman who never had any place in his poetry. Her business was to rear his children and to cook. Although the writers of the time understood that sensual love required the spiritual 
if it was to be more than merely a physical response of the passing moment. Yet nevertheless, they allowed these two to be divided into two parts, the physical love and the idealized spiritual love. For Dante and the other writers of his time, they had two views of love. One, the idealized spiritual love directed toward a disembodied phantom, and the other, a dray horse of a woman who kept her man's house and shared his bed. This produced not beauty, but ugliness. The Dome of Florence. Brunelleschi designed and built it. It brought together great artistic triumph with an overwhelming feat of engineering. What is especially overwhelming is that Brunelleschi was trained not as an architect, but as a goldsmith. This building, the Foundling Hospital, which you are now looking at, was also designed by Brunelleschi and was the first Renaissance building. More emphasis was placed upon man we know very little about those who built the Gothic cathedrals, who wrote the Gregorian chants, but now the artist himself became important. Here is a biography of Brunelleschi, and some of his contemporaries wrote autobiographies. Sculptures, portraits, and even self-portraits of the artists began to be made. At the beginning of the Renaissance, it could have gone either way. Nature could have had its proper place, man could have been in his proper place and would have been absolutely beautiful. But at a certain point along in the Renaissance, uh, the scales tipped and man put himself at the center absolutely. And this opened the door completely uh, to the whole destructive force of humanism that followed down through the Enlightenment and, and into our own day. Music was another large and important area in the time of the Renaissance. The composers of the Renaissance invented the art of orchestration. Not only did each instrument play a different voice, but a different melody line. The North influenced the South, not only in painting, but in music. String instruments of the Renaissance were built in matched sets so that the timber was uniform from bass right through the soprano instrument. Music was printed with movable type for the first time. This is the lute, the most popular solo instrument of the Renaissance. The sackbut, like our trombone. The viol, ancestor of our viola, the crumb horn, and the spinet. Up to this time, things could have gone in one of two ways. There could have been an emphasis on real people living in a real world which God had made, in which all individual things had importance because God had made the whole world. Or humanism could have taken over with its emphasis on the individual things being autonomous. But the die was cast. Man made himself increasingly independent. He made himself his own measure. He tried to make himself autonomous. 
The humanistic man of the Renaissance thought of the time before him as something unsavory, something to be forgotten. To him, it was the Dark Ages. And he thought of his own age as a great leap forward into his own period of rebirth or Renaissance. A rebirth of the pre-Christian golden age of ancient Greece and Rome. Thomas Aquinas had opened the door for this with his emphasis upon the teaching of Aristotle. This is a fresco painted by Raphael in the Vatican. It is called the School of Athens. The central figures in this fresco are Plato and Aristotle. Raphael painted the hands of these two men to represent their philosophic emphases. Plato, with his finger pointing upward, emphasized absolutes, ideals, meaning, value. But Aristotle, with his hand spread downward, emphasized the individual things, the particulars, nature, man. But what is the meaning of particulars, including me and you, if they have nothing, no final thing to be related to, so that they have meaning? And how do we know concerning our individual acts, whether they're right or wrong, if there is no absolute to give a certainty? The dilemma between any form of humanism uh, and um, biblical Christianity, it really rests at the question of whether we have to begin from man alone as autonomous and then build everything from that or whether there's truth from another source which is an absolute truth and which therefore is not relative. Now if we begin from the humanist truth, the view of truth rather, they don't have truth, all it ends with is a matter of statistical averages. And then it leads to the place where humanism has brought us in our own generation. Here is one example of uh, this dilemma. Fouquet's Red Virgin. Fouquet's model was Agnes Sorel, who was the mistress of Charles the Seventh, King of France. Was this the Madonna about to feed her baby? No. It might have had the title, The Red Virgin, but those who looked at the painting at that time knew who the woman was. She was the king's mistress. Prior to this, Mary was considered high and holy. Even earlier, she was thought of as so different from normal people that she was painted merely as a symbol. Painting Mary as a real person was an advance over the earlier paintings because the Bible tells us that Mary was a real girl and the baby Jesus was a real baby. This was the good side. Nature was given its proper place. On the other hand, the king's mistress could now be painted as Mary and meaning was being destroyed. At first, it might seem that only religious values were being threatened, but gradually the threat spread to all of knowledge and all of life. All meaning for all the individual things, the particulars, was removed. The individual things were made independent, autonomous, with nothing ultimately to relate them to, to give them meaning. We are now in the Academy in Florence, in a room given to Michelangelo's work. On either side, we see Michelangelo's statues called the captives. These used to be called unfinished statues, but now many scholars agree that they were left to say what Michelangelo wanted them to say. Man, 
is tearing himself out of the rock. Mankind will be victorious. As one passes these statues, we come to the focal point of the room, the magnificent statue of David. Out of a flawed piece of marble, Michelangelo, with all his genius, carved his David. A piece of art with few equals in the world. But this isn't the biblical David, but rather the personification of the humanist ideal, the greatness of man. But toward the end of his life, there were signs that Michelangelo saw that humanism was not enough. There was and there is no man like David. It is thought that in the Pietà, in the cathedral in Florence, he put his own face on Nicodemus as he was bending over Christ. Humanistic pride seems lessened, if not absent. We now come to another great giant of the Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci. He was the first modern mathematician, and he was a chemist, physicist, musician, architect, anatomist, botanist, mechanical engineer, and artist. He did studies of the human anatomy. Some could still be used in today's textbooks. He was the embodiment of the true Renaissance man. He could do almost everything and do it well. He designed war machines of savage atrocity. He designed the ball bearing. Leonardo really understood the problem of modern man. In his genius, he anticipated where humanism would end. He understood that humanistic man, beginning only with individual things, that is the particulars, had no unity by which to give them meaning. He understood that beginning humanistically with mathematics, one is left with individual things. And having only individual things, one could never come to universals or to meaning. Instead, one is left with mechanics. And in this, he saw ahead to our own day, where even man is viewed as a machine. Then Leonardo thought that perhaps the painter the sensitive man could come to meaning. So he tried and tried to portray the soul. This is not a soul in the Christian sense. Rather, he was trying to capture visually the universals from the particulars he observed. He failed. We're back to Raphael's school of Athens. Aquinas teaching led to man trying to be independent, autonomous, and this led to Renaissance humanism. Leonardo, in all his brilliance, felt the problem and struggled to find universals. 
Leonardo and all of humanism have been so sure that man beginning only from himself could solve every problem. Its cry was, I can do what I will, just give me till tomorrow. But in his old age, Leonardo in his brilliancy saw the coming defeat of humanism. As a man thinketh, so is he. And humanism had already begun to show its natural conclusion was pessimism. When Francis I, King of France, took Leonardo to France, we find Leonardo in despondency. Anybody who doesn't feel the beauty of the Renaissance as he walks through Florence, I feel is a poor man. And I love to go to Florence and walk through the museums and just walk through the streets. But on the other hand, one who only sees the beauty and the glory of the Renaissance, in which man was increasingly making himself autonomous. If you don't feel the weakness of this, you also don't understand the Renaissance. Humanism invariably ends in despair. If you begin with that which is finite, no matter how far you project it, you can never come to an absolute, never. In the light of the humanist dilemma, there is only one real solution, to turn to this book as truth, turn to the Bible, not just as an abstract religious thing, but as truth. It doesn't change. It speaks to the culture of that particular day. It's never old fashioned. It speaks to the most current topics, and yet it is always rooted in the same thing, the existence of this infinite personal God and his having spoken. And then, of course, for man's personal need in the death of Christ for him. I'm going to start sleep, sleeping, sitting in the back of the room to make sure nobody's sleeping. <laughs> okay, let's do a little bit of review. We've looked at ancient Rome. What do you remember about the gods of ancient Rome? What were they? The Zeuses and the Apollos and all those. They were extensions of humanity, but they weren't perfect. They, they weren't divine. They, they had the same jealousies and weaknesses and sins of the flesh that humans did. And the worldview would not sustain the culture because it didn't have absolute morals and values that gave meaning to human life. And we looked at the Christians in that era and they were perceived as um, undesirable. They were thought they were traitors. Remember, they, they were not conforming to what the Caesars told them to do. And, and they had their faith in God, and they were willing to live for it and die for it. And they believed God had revealed himself. And if you remember one of the studies we did, uh, I forget which one it was, where, oh, it was, it was, um, it was when we were in, in Romans and in civil disobedience in chapter 13. And the author that I was reading said, the Christians were persecuted for their faith, but Rome fell and Christian took, Christianity took the day. They didn't need an army. Jesus didn't raise up an army with, with bullets and bows and arrows and guns and stuff. The, the success of the Christians in Rome was that they believed that God was with them, whatever they did. Now, they didn't obey, did they? They said, we're not going to do it. You can kill me if you want, and they did. But eventually Rome succumbed to Christianity. They didn't blot it out with all the persecutions. So we looked at that, and then we moved into what we called the Middle Ages. And what was the issue in the Middle Ages? What did we find there? You remember? Where was education? Primarily restricted to monasteries and, and to people. The, the, the Bible kind of got lost a little bit. Some of the biblical truths were being compromised. And we ended with um, the discussion of Aristotle, not Aristotle, but Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, who was one of the most influential Roman Catholic theologians. He wrote a book called the Summa Theologica, the Summa Theology. And he had an in, imperfect view of the fall, remember? He, he thought man fell uh, physically and emotionally, but not, spirit, not, not intellectually. His, his mind hadn't fallen, so he elevated the intellect 
and began to introduce Aristotle back into the equation. And so we're going to look now as we go into the, um, the study tonight of, of the Renaissance. So let, you've got your notes in front of you. And uh, the one thing that he said on every one of the videos so far is at the end he almost always has his hand on a Bible or he's pointing to the Bible. And he's saying the answer is never going to be found in independent man. It's going to be found in God's revelation to man. That this is truth. This is what you build your life on. And that'll be a constant theme throughout, throughout the series, as you'll see. So the word renaissance has taken up the identifier as it's a rebirth from the Dark Ages. The, the, as he was talking about the people of the Renaissance, they thought the Dark Ages um, was something unattractive. They were having this new birth of things that were attractive, and that was reflected in their art, architecture, and so forth. And the two juggernauts, well, basically the first thing I wrote down is the emphasis on this period can be summed up as follows. Man made himself increasingly independent and autonomous. From what? From God. Man could sort it out. Man could figure it out. Man doesn't need um, God. And I've always, I've always, you know, when I've had conversations with people who are um, objecting to Christianity, uh, Nicky Gumbel wrote a book um, in the Alpha series said the seven most common objections to Christianity. I can only remember two. Uh, it's been a while, but the two are the two biggest. Um, the first one is, what about other religions? What about people that don't know? What, what's God's provision for people that never heard of the message? And the other was, why does God allow suffering? That, that why do some people suffer and others don't? Those are objections to, to God, right? And I don't have good answers for either one of those. I mean, I do for the other religions. Uh, that's in Romans 1. Everybody knows there's a God. Man is without excuse. You might not know the only God, but you know there is a God. And if you reject that, you end up in a, in a downward cycle. Uh, suffering is a mystery. Um, when we do this, the, the study course on, on Christian healing, it's, it's brought up that, that there is a, a mystery to suffering. And there's suffering sometimes because I brought it on myself. You know, I, I could do a stupid thing and suffer as a consequence, right? Um, I could um, suffer by being a witness for Christ. Jesus said we would suffer, that there would be, that there would be suffering. Uh, and sometimes there's redemptive suffering. That, that the, the example of Joseph is one I like to use, that Joseph was sold by his brothers and he suffered under the accusation of Potiphar's wife and he eventually became the prime minister of Egypt and when he met his brothers, what you intended for evil, God meant for good. God sent me here. That's redemptive suffering. So these are mysteries of suffering. And um, they're not easily explained. But here's the thing behind those objections is what I found where, where I'm going down this road. I've often found that if I asked this question, if I were to satisfy every objection, would you give your life to Christ? And you see the motivation behind objecting is so they don't have to bow the knee of their heart to the king of kings. They want to find a reason to disqualify him from being their Lord and Savior. And if I said, if I can answer every objection to your satisfaction, will you give your life to Christ? And that exposes the facade that they're only making the arguments against God so they don't have to um, yield their autonomy. And you see, that's in the Lord's Prayer, isn't it? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's surrendering your volition to him. Uh, how many of you like veto power? I veto that. I'm going to veto that. I'm not going to do that. No, that's not, that's not what I want to do. It's my life. And uh, Frank Sinatra made a big hit song out of that, right? What was anybody that song? I'll do it my way. And we all, that's, that's the, 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 so putting man at the middle. So he talked about Leonardo da Vinci at the end and Michael, Michelangelo at the end, both of them. And we've heard those names. They're, they're very common to us in Western culture. Leonardo da Vinci was the embodiment of the Renaissance man. These were the things that he's noted for. He was a chemist, a musician, an architect, drew all those pictures of the anatomy, uh, a botanist, a mechanical engineer, and an artist. That's a pretty amazing human being, isn't it? And what was, what was Francis Schaeffer's reflection on how Leonardo ended with all those gifts and with all those abilities? Where did Leonardo end? 
in some measure of despondency because he realized that all those things could not give ultimate meaning and purpose to his life. He could do all these amazing things. Uh, and, and we're the beneficiary of those beautiful things that he, that he produced. Uh, Michelangelo was the one that he um, really had a good example on. That was with the, the statue of David. And did you catch it in, in, his, in his comment? It was in passing. He said, this is not the biblical David. Did you hear that? Now, I, I'd forgotten that if I ever knew it. I mean, uh, that must have glossed over me because that is a... What's that, Jerry? It, that's right. It's his David. It's, it's, not, it's not a David. It, it's not David, the king of Israel, in, in, in any formal way. I mean, I, if you'd have asked me, I'd have said, well, that's King David. That's the king, David, the king of Israel. But it's not. It's this humanistic uh, expression of man in his glory, autonomous from the creator. And uh, I didn't realize how big it was. Have, have any of you ever been there to see it? Some of you, yes, yeah, some of you have been there. Uh, 17 feet, Philip says it's 17 feet. Yeah, Ellie's been there, RC's been there. Right. Yeah, I mean, he said it's one of those beautiful art pieces of artwork in, 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 in history, you know, of, of humanity. It's just gorgeous. But man um, coming out of the rock, man making himself great, man will be victorious. What do you guys think about the Red Virgin? I mean, it, you know, when he started putting together Mary and the baby, the virgin and the child, and now you get the, the king's mistress and she's a little, little racy, you know, it was not um, discreet. It was very in your face what, what he was portraying. And the diminishment of the holy but with the profane is, is, is what we see there in, in the art. Um, Dante was another one he mentioned. He mentioned the Divine Comedy, and it was a mixture of the Christian and the pagan. The Christian that there's a hell. People go to hell for their misdeeds. And he mixed it with the classical world. And I didn't know this till I read his book, that uh, the guide in uh, the Divine Comedy in hell is the Roman poet Virgil. <laughs> He's the one showing them all around. So I guess Virgil's in hell, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't spend a lot of time in the classics, to be, be honest with you. Um, but the sinners in hell, of course, Judas would be there, right? Um, he, he betrayed Christ. And then he's got, you know, these other guys, Brutus and Cassius, who betrayed Caesar. So it's kind of a mixture of the classics, the Rome, um, and, and the Greek. What's that, Judy? Making them equal. You're putting them kind of on the same page. So you've got these great guys that can paint, that can build, that can that can write, and, and then you've got um, this guy, Bernicelli, who builds this bell tower in Florence. And you remember what his credential was? He was a goldsmith, <laughs> not trained in engineering, not, not trained in architecture. And then the one guy that kind of got it right was this uh, Josh Van Eyck, and that was the adoration of the Lamb, and that had nature in its proper place, the landscape was beautiful, the... the, the um, Proportions were right. The people to the buildings and the trees were right. And then he had Christ right. That, how many of you had seen that picture before? The, the lamb on the altar with, with the, the, the heart pierced, pouring the blood into the, the communion cup. I mean, that's a powerful, I mean, that, that's powerful theology. It's the poor. It's the rich. It's, it's, it's still got it. That was the one. And that's why he said, you know, there was a time when it could have gone either way. And this reflected one of the expressions where it was still putting God and man in its proper place, in nature. God, man, and nature in its proper place. Um, so both Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci discovered, um, they both tried to synthesize Aristotle and Christian thought, but it didn't work. And humanism is going to be on the rise as we get to the end of this period, the, the the message of the gospel in art, literature, painting, architecture, music is being diminished and the glory of man is being elevated and that's going to lead us into um, a period of reformation. The next one is going to be on the reformation. There was pushback to some of this and he'll get into some of the pushback with the Roman Catholic stuff that was going on. But what happened after the reformation? What do we call the next phase? The enlightenment, right? And that's going to move us further down the road of um, humanism. 
he ended up as saying the logical outworking of humanism is pessimism. Um, I've started rereading a book by Chuck Colson, which I read years ago. It's called Kingdoms in Conflict. Um, Chuck Colson, as you remember, was involved in Watergate. He was the gatekeeper to, uh, to Nixon. He was the guy right outside the Oval Office. He let people in or not in. Very influential. And he ended up being uh, guilty of these crimes. And he spent some time in prison. And he reflected on his life. I think he had some church in his early life, like most of them that era did. But it wasn't impactful. But he really came to faith in Christ. And... He started a prison ministry because he saw how the prisoners weren't even attended to with trying to help them become better people. It was not even perceived that they would be rehabilitated. They were just punished and, and then released. So he started getting literature, started getting prayer. He, he really did a lot of things in, in, in the prisons of America. Uh, very influential there. But this book, Kingdoms in Conflict, the very first chapter is the story of Ernest Hemingway. And I didn't know his nickname. His nickname was Papa, apparently. That was his nickname. And it talked about how he loved to live life, the race before the bulls. He, he was involved in, in the war in Spain, and, and he, he, just, he just loved life. But his life, as it diminished, didn't have any purpose for him. And even though the books he read and the notoriety and the fame and the fortune and, and all the things that he got involved with, he recognized that what he put his life into had no meaning as he aged. And he went to Montana and blew his head off with his favorite 12-gauge shotgun because he couldn't see a future for what his foundation was so flawed. And that's the first chapter in this book. It's a really good read. He tells lots of stories. It's, it's, it's not heavy lifting. But in the book, and this is a, the reason I started reading it, because when we did the thing on civil disobedience, he has a whole chapter on the role of the church and the role of the government. And they're two separate roles. The government's role is different from the church's role. They should be complimented with to pray for the rulers that we could have a peaceful life, but they have two very different roles and two very different appointments of God. And I don't want to get into it tonight. We don't have time. But I'm thinking about doing at least an overview of the book because there's so many nuggets in it. He's got Dietrich Bonhoeffer in there. Um, really good stuff. It was written in 1977, I think. So it goes back in the Rolodex. It's, uh, so I started rereading it. I like it. Well, what I did, because I don't know how many of you have a lot of understanding of who Aristotle was or what he believed or why it's such a threat to Christianity. If you were to ask me, what did Aristotle say or do that was so objectionable to Christianity and why is Aquinas kind of the bad guy that let it sneak in? So I went to the ultimate source, the internet, and I found two little paragraphs that summarize why Aristotle is a threat to the church. And I thought this might be helpful. We can just take a minute and read through these. So you have them in your notes. I've even put the link in the um, link in it. I think I did, didn't I? Yeah, there's a link if you want to go. It's not a very long article, but I said Aristotle and Christianity, and a bunch of articles came up. But this is what this guy said, and I liked it. Basically, because I like the simple short version, right? Aristotle became the patron saint of modern science. His method of learning was not about revelation, waiting for a voice from heaven. It was all about observation, the scientific method. Beginning with the Renaissance, this is where Aristotle and um, Thomas Aquinas kind of get to the church, and culminating in the Enlightenment, God was continually being pushed to the fringe of society. That's what Schaefer's been saying, hasn't it? Man is ascending, God is descending, um, man is putting himself central, God has moved to the fringe, right? People became increasingly confident in man's ability to explain his world apart from divine revelation. So remember when we first started, I said there were three questions. These are the basic questions of life. Where did I come from? How can I find meaning and purpose in this life? And where do I go when I die? So those are answered for us in the Bible. Where did I come from? I'm made in his image. What's my purpose in life? To love and serve him and, and to, to find my life and meaning in what he has given us in this earth to do for him. And then where do I go when I die? I go back to God. Now, those are very satisfying answers for the Christian. 
And the people have a different answer. I said, well, what's your answer? Where did you come from? Well, I'm a, a cosmic accident. I came from the goo and became a man and, you know, whatever you want to say. And what's your purpose in life? Well, eat, drink, and be merry like everybody else. And what happens if you die? There is nothing after death. I mean, this is it. All right. Good luck with that. Um, so, apart from divine revelation... Uh, they grew optimistic about man's ability to approve, or I should say improve, it. Maybe, I, maybe that was a typo, approve his world. They saw a golden age just around the corner, and science and reason would lead them there. How prevalent is that in our culture today, that, that, that thought? It came from Aristotle, that was his thinking, and it crept into the church through Thomas Aquinas, and it's been in our culture because... Um, he didn't get into it in, in the book, he didn't mention it in the video tonight, but the, the resurgence of Plato, Aristotle, and the classical world came from the fall of the Byzantine Empire when Constantinople fell, where did all the Christians run to? They went to Rome, so they took all their books and all their, their, their poets and all their philosophies and philosophers, not, not, I'm saying Christian and non-Christian, they got out of there because it, it was destroyed were taken over, really, by, by the Muslims. I think it was in 4, 14, 38 or something long in there. So th this, this elevated Plato and Aristotle again, coming back along. So the second paragraph, notice that it wasn't science that was leading the people away from God. Rather, it was the assumption that science was capable of explaining everything about our world apart from God. Aristotle gave people confidence that they didn't need to look to God for answers. They could find them through up observing the objects around them. Now, how many of you have heard of John Lennox? He's an Irishman who is a mathematician, and he taught for years in Oxford and Cambridge. He's a very, very brilliant man. He's a Christian apologist, and he has debated the Stephen Hawking's of the world. He's debated the great atheists of the world, the great physicists of the world, and he presents Christianity. They present their worldview, and he does it intellectually without a lot of you know, arguing or fighting. He just challenges their assumption and tells you why he's brilliant. There's a bunch of YouTubes on him. If you look up John Lennox, you can see a lot of his teaching. They're very interesting. He's very articulate, and he's He's not over the head either. He doesn't talk way over the head. I enjoyed listening to him because he's succinct and he's solid and he's clear. He said this, and I was at a conference with him. He was live in conference in Alpharetta about two years ago, and I said, i got to go hear this guy. So I'm sitting there, and he does this whole presentation. At the end of it, he had this thing on science, and this is my reflection or my remembrance of what he said. But look at your paper. It says, Christian, this is John Lennox. He's a Christian author and apologist has stated the goal of science today is to disprove the biblical account of creation and to have an answer to every claim of the Christian faith. That's the goal of science today, to put Christianity out of business. We will have an answer for everything by science. That's Aristotle. That's exactly what Aristotle said, how we should find by observation in, in, in our own ability to understand the universe that we live in. What Lennox pref prefaces that by saying is, all the great discoveries of the early scientists were discovering God in creation, not trying to disprove God was the creator. They were, just, they were saying, look at what God did. Look at this. Look at that. They were excited about the discovery of what God had revealed to them. Sir Isaac Newton, you probably don't know, was, uh, he was in England, and he was given dispensation for his, I can't remember if he was Catholic or Protestant, Whichever one he was, the, the government wasn't, but they gave him freedom to be who he was. Does that make sense? So if the king was a Protestant, he was a Catholic, the king gave him an okay, vice versa. I can't remember. He wrote over a million words of commentary on the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. Sir Isaac Newton. He took those two apocalyptic books. Daniel is the Old Testament, the end times. Revelation is the New Testament end times. He studied it. He wrote over a million words of commentary on the Bible. He was discovering God in the Bible. These birds, Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, um, they were kind of losing the fact that it was God who made us. It's God who tells us what life's about, etc. 
So I thought um, we'd just take a minute and look at some scriptures that may give a little bit of scriptural support to what we've been hearing, mostly through art and literature and science and so forth. If you have your Bibles, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, chapter... Uh, chapter 1, I forgot the 1, 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 31. For those of you at home watching, these notes should, should be on the, on the, on the, on the net. Um, I, so, I might not have posted them, sorry, I'll get them tomorrow, I'll get them there. I might not have done it. Uh, Missy wasn't in today, and I'm, I might have messed up. But anyway, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 31. This is something Paul wrote about the people that might be in some wise connected to the ones we just heard about tonight. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Since the wisdom of God, the world didn't know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. God has intentionally set it up to frustrate those that want to figure him out through their own wisdom and reason. It is by faith and belief that you get to know God. I've told you this many times, uh, it's worth repeating, the two most greatest barriers for people to know God are great wealth and great learning. The more money you have, the more wealth you have, the harder it is for you to see the reason for God because you have everything you need. You can become your own God, right? We're doing stewardship this month. And uh, how hard is it is for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven? Well, it's like a camel going through the eye of the needle. And most of you know that reference to the eye of the needle is a camel had to get down on its fours and crawl through a gate to get in. That was the eye of the needle. And if he had anything on his back, i.e. sin, baggage, that had to go. You can't take the stuff with you. You had to barely get in. So rich people have a hard time often, not always, but often hearing the message because they don't have the need. In the Magnificat, when, when, when Mary is saying, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and, and she says, And the rich he sends empty away. In the Magnificat, the rich he sends empty away. Mary's reflection, you know, he, she, she said yes to the Lord. So God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Um, in the, words of, in the words of Jesus, if you want to be first, what do you have to do? If you want to have the most, if you want to be the greatest, he's confounded the wisdom of this world. Because that does not make sense to fallen humanity, does it? That, that's like foolishness. So let's move on. Um, For the Jews demand a sign, the Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. This is a stumbling block to the Jews. Why would God kill his son? Stumbling block, you get that. Didn't make sense to them. The Messiah was not supposed to end up on the cross. He's supposed to come in on a horse and free him from the oppressive Romans, right? Uh, so it's foolishness to, a stumbling block to the Jews, and it's foolishness to the Gentiles. They don't get it. Um, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God, the wisdom, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. It goes on to finish with this. Consider your calling. Not many of you were wise according to the standards. Um, most of us aren't going to be Michelangelo or Leonardo DiCaprio with every gift known to man. I mean, I'm I'm not any of those things he is. I, I don't have any qualifications. Uh, chemistry, engineering, art. No, forget it. Um, botany, no. Um, drawing pictures of human skeleton, no. Th th none of that's me. So I qualify. I'm not one of those. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. That would conclude most of us in this room, right? How many of you are powerful, have come from nobility, are, you know, one of the elites? Look who we're serving. Jesus Christ. Right? So... 
Um, God has chosen to, the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He chose the weak to shame the strong. He chose the low and despised of the world, even the things that are not, to bring nothing, 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 <laughs> nothing things that are, so that no human being can boast in the presence of God. And because of him you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God's righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. Now I wrote down another scripture too. If you just want to write down 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, it's in the next chapter from chapter 1, which is where we were. The next chapter says this in verse 14. So if you've got your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, it says this. The natural man, what does, what's the natural man? One who's not born again. The natural man. Um, the natural man does not accept the things from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. For he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Natural man doesn't get it. Natural man doesn't know he can't be the measure of all things. He can't find meaning and purpose outside of his relationship with his Creator. And if you want to go to John... Not 3.16, John 3.5, John, John chapter 3, Gospel of John chapter 3, not verse 16, we all know that one, but go to chapter, chapter 3 and look at verse 3 and verse 5, it says this, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. And verse 5, unless you're not born of the Spirit and of water, you can't enter the kingdom. In other words, what Francis is going to say, when humanism takes, takes over, we become blind to the things of God. They don't make sense to us. And that's repeated a little bit in Romans um, chapter 8. If you want to write that down, Romans 8, verses 5 through 8. Um, it basically says the man who sets his mind on the flesh uh, is going to go toward death. The man who sets his mind on the spirit has life. And the man who sets his mind on the flesh, the things of the spirit are foolishness to him again. So the point is... As we go down this road from where the Christian church started in the first century with God, absolutes, understanding who we are, purpose of life, willing to live for it, not bow to Caesar, not deal with idolatry, to a compromise that happens uh, pretty much after Constantine. You know, in the book of Revelation, each church as a representation of the, of the, of the, of the Christian church history. The first church is Ephesus. That's the apostolic age. The second church is Smyrna. That's the age of suffering. Smyrna means suffering. I live in Smyrna, and I, I don't suffer. I must say I don't. I have a nice life in Smyrna. But myrrh, Smyrna, suffering. The third, Pergamum. You know what the name Pergamum means? Mixed marriage. The church married the world and became compromised by the world, the institution. So I won't go through the rest of them, but think of that. Ephesus apostolic they went out Smyrna they suffered Pergamum they mixed the marriage and they started going downhill from that so that's our teaching for tonight we, we did it in a little less than an hour I think that was good um, next week we're going to move on with the Reformation which is something that is very dear to us in terms of our own tradition we are birthed out of the Reformation it's something we probably have a lot more familiarity with in terms of the, the content but you see the progression. When you begin to unplug this from the equation, what happens to the health and fabric of the culture? Man goes up, God goes down, and we'll see the outworking of that as we go on. There's still Christendom. Most people went to church. Most people said they were Christian in the Renaissance. They had that. The Reformation, certainly. But eventually we're going to get to the point where... Um, It gets bad. I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, so thanks for coming. Those of you who joined on, at, online at home, thank you. And let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the study. Thank you for all we've learned. Help us to continue to grow in the knowledge of how this book is to guide our life. And we are to be the salt of the earth. We are to be the light of the world. If the salt loses its saltiness, it doesn't have any value. And if the lamp is put under the bushel, and doesn't give light, it's of no value. So, Lord, help us to um, be salt and light in our day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.